Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Roundtable. I'm your host, Adam Cook. And this week, we're going around the Municipal Council table once again, as we hear from two recent presenters at the Richmond Council Committee of the Whole meeting, which took place on Monday evening at the Council Chambers in Arishat. Later on, we'll hear from the Cape Breton Office of Housing Nova Scotia about some programs that could help you in terms of making upgrades to your home, especially if you have an aging relative moving back in with you. But we begin with the issue of physician recruitment and healthcare recruitment overall, not just doctors, but also nurses, CCAs, and others that are integral to the running of the healthcare system here in the Strait area. That's been the focus of Richmond County native Gina McDonald since she took on a post in December with the Cape Breton South Recruiting for Health Committee. McDonald is now the committee's healthcare recruitment navigator and she updated the committee's activities at Monday's Committee of the Whole meeting for Richmond Council in Arishat, along with making a financial pitch for council to consider contributing municipal funds to the committee. Here's Gina McDonald's report right now. Cape Breton South Recruiting for Health is a community organization and it started essentially to concentrate specifically on recruiting and retaining healthcare professionals in the Cape Breton South region which encapsulates all of Richmond County and the town of Port Hawkesbury. Uh, the group is a partnership with many other groups and organizations. Uh, we are very fortunate to have the support of both the Richmond County Council and Port Hawkesbury Town Council. We have a lot of local healthcare representatives and institutions and many other members at large from the community who are partners and stakeholders and and want to see us uh, advance our goals as well. So the goal of our group is that Cape Breton South community members can access the health care services they need and that starts by identifying and acknowledging specific access to health care circumstances and challenges in the region and make every effort to address them. And how is this accomplished? So in practical terms, we have to advocate for ourselves and for our communities. We have to go out and get new people. We have to work hard to keep them here. And we have to come up with innovative ways to get Cape Breton South access to the health care services they need. So the fundamental function of a community organization in the recruitment process is to attract health care professionals and work with and support Nova Scotia Health in a collective effort to have those candidates live and work here. So the recruitment process for our organization employs several strategies. Um, like I said, working with Nova Scotia recruitment consultants is very important. Assisting with and delivering site visits and community tours, hosting rural recruitment events, building relationships with healthcare students and residents, and provide healthcare learner encouragement. Um, that one is important because we, um, we do a lot of our recruiting and a lot of the most successful recruiting in the area comes from building up a network of, um, of contacts based on contacts of existing healthcare professionals. So we have to make sure that we keep those lines of communication open because speaking with doctors about their doctor friends is going to, uh, is going to go a lot further than perhaps some of the other strategies that we might employ. Uh, identifying and participating in healthcare professional networks, conferences, and career fairs. So because of a provincial, not even a provincial, a nationwide uh, doctor and nurse shortage, doctors are not going to fall out of the sky and land in Richmond County. We have to go out and get them and make sure that they come here. And like I said, engage the public with a professional website and social media presence. That allows us to make sure that the lines of communication are open and give people confidence that we're the people that they can come to if they have any recruitment leads for us. So the mainland organizations like ours concentrate only on physician recruitment, but Cape Breton South Recruiting for Health is looking to recruit all different healthcare professionals in different disciplines, so we're looking for nurses, CCAs, lab techs, paramedics, pharmacists, anyone who can come in and improve the access to healthcare services in the area. So another important component of the work that we do is retention. 
And this often takes the shape of using word of mouth to make sure that all of our healthcare professionals are taken care of and that they're shown that they are valued. Uh, we have to make sure that um, them and their families are all supported in the community and that we're able to get them access to the information or services that they need uh, in order to make them comfortable and make them want to make Richmond County and Port Hawkesbury their long-term home. So housing is a pressing issue as far as that's concerned. I know that it is all over the province, but that's something that we are concentrating on and trying to find solutions in maintaining our workforce. Uh, also ensuring that new healthcare workers feel welcome and supported in their community by engaging them with different cultural groups and activities. Um, as we all know, having someone to call to find out where there's, you know, a good table and chairs. If you're not from here and you don't know when recycling day is, having local connections in the community are going to go a long way towards making you feel more comfortable. As we look ahead towards achieving our goals for 2022, securing adequate funding is necessary for us to continue our efforts. So as a community organization, Cape Breton South Recruiting for Health is responsible for securing all of its own funding. And what will the funding specifically pay for? So operational costs, which uh, includes my salary and all of the administrative work that the Dr. Kingston Memorial Clinic does on our behalf. Uh, retention activities, so the locum housing assistance is an example of that. Recognition projects like the award ceremony that we had at the Civic Center on Thursday night. Um, gift baskets and other kind of uh, appreciation tokens that we give to the different uh, candidates, residents, doctors that we have coming here to show them what Cape Breton is like. We give them things like cookbooks and you know, cribbage boards and things like that to introduce them to, to what they might be walking into. And then also recruitment activities. So career fairs and uh, conferences, professional uh, promotional video is one th a project that we have on our list for this year, hoping that we'll be able to expand our reach to prospective pools of healthcare professionals. Local recruitment and attraction activities, so site visits and community tours and uh, other attraction activities like excursions and meals when we do have people in the area. So, as you know, all of these things cost quite a bit of money. This is the breakdown, to be a little bit more specific. These are estimates, just because we don't have any way of knowing uh, how many doctors or nurses <coughs> might want to come. We won't know until we know. So we've made our best guess based on previous years and also in being optimistic in how many new people we might be able to get to come to our area this year. So we're trying to set ourselves up to be able to accommodate the activity that we think will be reasonable to expect in 2022 and the actual amount of program delivery that we're going to be able to accomplish is based on the amount of funding that we're going to be able to secure. So our projected funding requirements for 2022 will be an estimated $108,250. We have set an ambitious agenda, but we're confident that our goals are realistic, that we have the human resources and planning in place to accomplish them. Our goals are targeted specifically in the interests of residents of Port Hawkesbury and Richmond County, and as a committee, we feel that the success of our efforts will be hugely impactful to healthcare in this area. So to that end, as you continue your budget deliberations, Cape Breton South Recruiting for Health is respectfully submitting a request to Richmond County Council for $30,000 in funding for 2022, in addition to a three-year commitment to provide our committee with the same annual funding. We have made the same request for the funding and commitment from the Port Hawkesbury Town Council last week. So the remaining funding that we will need in order to accomplish our goals that we set, uh, we hope to secure through support from other organizations, grants, and fundraising. We are committed to our goals and to involving our communities in achieving them, 
and we hope our partners and stakeholders will be able to see the value in the work that we're trying to do and support us in our efforts. But I do see here on, on your on your form here that um, RCMP is, is being represented by the EH, EHS uh, members right at the moment or not? Right yeah, so yeah. when in my discussions with EHS, uh, they said that right now they don't have the resources to have someone commit to attending the meetings just because of scheduling and things like that. Uh, a lot of the local members are aware of the work that we're doing, and we do have conversations with them more casually, but at the moment they don't have any resources to, to commit to our committee specifically. As we're working towards like recruiting of um, particularly, let's say, pharmacists, right, who would work in private settings in a lot of cases, mm -hmm. um, have we reached out to some of those businesses who would be looking to probably backfill? Like I have a friend who's the pharmacist at Foodland at St. Peter's, and I know she's always looking for someone to replace her. So I wonder if we may be able to get some corporate sponsorship from some of those folks as I well. I actually have spoken to all of them yeah. because we did have uh, one particular uh, potential recruit that came mm -hmm. forward and contacted all of the pharmacies to see if they had any interest. Yeah. We actually just had another pharmacist come down the pipe yesterday. Okay. So all of the, um, all of the applicable businesses mm -hmm. will be contacted going forward to make sure that we have all of them in the mix. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Well, Gina, um, you know, Council is heading into you know, our budget discussions, and I'm sure this will be <coughs> something that we consider uh, going forward. Um, that will probably be a more of a May timeline. Um, sure. Yeah. Also taking part in Monday's Committee of the Whole meeting at the Richmond Municipal Council Chambers in Arishat were two representatives from Nova Scotia Housing, specifically from the Cape Breton Office of Nova Scotia Housing. They had some details about programs that municipalities can participate in, but also that individuals like you and me can participate in, especially those who might have elderly relatives moving back in and want to make them feel more comfortable in their own homes. So here is that presentation from Housing Nova Scotia's Cape Breton office right now. So we'll talk a little bit about some of our uh, confusion that happens around our name with housing, because the general people here are housing and they think of uh, housing programs, housing Nova Scotia, and then there's the housing authorities and those kind of things. So uh, what we are is we're, the housing Nova Scotia is basically a delivery agent for the province of Nova Scotia. Um, all staff are actually um, from the Department of Municipal Affairs and Housing. So it's actually, there's no staff within housing Nova Scotia. That's the kind of lead name that delivers the programs on behalf of government. So just add a third housing in there to make everything a little confusing. Um, the housing authority is something different from us, and we, both offices usually get a lot of calls from each other and a lot of confusion around what roles are which. So our programs are aimed mostly at, uh, primarily at homeowners uh, to help provide, um, improve the conditions of housing to make it safe uh, and adequate housing for individuals to stay within their home. And we do this with a series of grants and um, uh, grants and loan programs. So we have forgivable loans, we have grants, and we have some straight repayable programs as well. So the first requirement we have of eligibility is the household income limits. And another layer of uh, confusion is the uh, what we call bedroom counts. And so we go by bedroom counts, and there's a one-bedroom, two-bedroom, and a three-bedroom. But these aren't actually based on physical bedrooms within a house. So an individual or a couple would be a one-bedroom count, even though they may live in a three-bedroom house. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's broken down, and so each individual or couple is one. Uh, an additional person in the house would be another second person. Uh, individual, if you have two people under the age of 18 that are of the same gender, um, that would be considered a single bedroom count again. And um, so we have those, and each, each bedroom count accumulates to come up with the one, two, or three bedroom levels that we have. So for outside of CBRM, the uh, income limits for each of those categories is uh, 47500 for an individual or couple, uh, 54500 for uh, an individual or couple and one other individual, and then the top is $64,000. So, And these recently, probably within the past six months, yeah. it has changed to make an increase in those, uh, <clears throat> in, in those income levels. So it's allowed us to, to reach out and help more individuals and, and get more participation in the program. Um, they're, they're reviewed on a regular basis by CMHC in the province, so they they will change um, at during sometimes depending on um, whatever studies or whatever analysis those two groups do. So, yeah. 
And these are net income numbers, right? These are gross, gross income, gross income yeah. numbers. Yeah. Yeah. Most sources of income are counted in, in our programs, but there are a few cases where we have um, income that's excluded from it. Um, so as child support payments um, that are made, those are excluded from the income levels. Some of these would have been previously included, but they've been, uh, over time, some of them have been excluded because they saw it as uh, fitting to help more people at, uh, uh, with the programs. Um, if you have a person living in the house that's uh, up to the age of 25 that's attending a full-time uh, program in a university or if they're in school, uh, with verified enrollment, we can actually exclude any income. So you have a lot of students that are working part-time, making a bit of money. Um, in the past, that would have put them over income for the household. And knowing that a lot of that resource goes to pay for their education, their, their ongoing uh, requirements while they're going to school and that stuff, it really was seen as something that kind of was, uh, although they're making money, there's still an added burden for attending university and that stuff. So that's been excluded. Uh, scholarships and bursaries. Um, one-time payments, so uh, one example is this past year with the COVID relief and that kind of stuff, individual seniors were receiving a one-time $500 payment. That's excluded from income, so we don't have to count that because it's a one-time injection of money that, that uh, could put somebody over, but we exclude that to, uh, because of it's only one time, it's not considered. But now if you receive an annual um, payment from a uh, registered income fund, even though it's one payment per year, if it's a regular payment every year, that's considered normal regular payments, so that would be counted, but one-time one -time payments are excluded. All right, so, for example, if you were to take out a lump sum out of your RRSP mm -hmm. one year, but it's not a regular occurring thing each year, then that would be excluded. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And GST and HD, HSD payments are not included. And so we'll get into some of the other... other <coughs> um, items that we have for our uh, eligibility. So we look at uh, primarily it's issues with a home that would be if you have structural issues and services to the home. So if you have issues with electrical, arcing, sparking, roof leaking, no heat, no water, no sewer, um, that's primarily what our programs are, are geared towards, helping with those kind of um, critical infrastructure needs within the home. Um, what we consider is repairs that are under $1,000 are considered household maintenance. So our programs would look at anything above $1,000 or over. Uh, one thing is you must own and occupy a house for uh, a minimum of one year. So you might have somebody who had bought a house, but they had not resided there um, for a year or two. So it's, um, you have to live within the house for a year and own it for that period. Uh, we do consider previous assistance, as we'll get into later on with some of the programs, is that we have programs that you get, uh, if you get maximum assistance, it's for a 15-year period, and some programs are for a five-year period and that kind of stuff. So those things are factored in, and some are dependent on if the house had received some of that assistance before, not just the person. Right, so for example, if uh, you purchase a house and the previous owner had received assistance from us, we would consider that as part of the previous assistance and factor it into how much money would be available to the new owner of the home. Okay. Right. Oh, based on the home versus it's just based on the home. Yeah. But also based on, but also could be based on the owner. Like if an owner moved from yeah. home to home, would it also get? Yeah, there's some programs that yeah. are at the individual level. So not all programs are tied specifically okay. to those. Yeah. The longer term, bigger programs are tied to the, the, the structure itself. Yeah. Oh, the structure. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, pre, uh, the home must be assessed uh, for two hundred thousand dollars or less, and that'd be at the cap. So um, with the way that the uh, price has been going up and, and, and <laughs> on homes, it's just been outstripping the, um, um, some of the increases and that stuff. So what we do is we allow for it to be the capped amount. So it's, um, otherwise a fair number of people will be excluded from, the, okay. from getting assistance rate. So yeah. it does go by that cap figure. Um, so another thing is you can't own more than one residential property. So um, if somebody has a primary house and they also have a house that they may have a family member living in, they may have it as a rental property, um, that program would not be, um, you would not be eligible for this kind of assistance. Because looking at people who are having difficulty maintaining their primary residence. We, we use the uh, property online to determine how the property is assessed. And we've run into situations where a property was assessed as residential, but it was basically a building lot with nothing on it or a home that's been abandoned for years. So in that case, we wouldn't count that. Yeah. Okay. So if it's if it's not uh, habitable, right. if there's no right. if there's no facilities like uh, electric, um, mm. sewer, water, and those kind of things. Uh, property taxes must be current, and 
um, recognize that we're dealing with the vulnerable population with income levels and that stuff that you know you can get behind in property tax but if they came to the municipality and have a they have an adequate arrangement in place with the municipality that they're making regular payments and that's something we would we would figure we would count that as being um, in, in in line um, we we can only approve um, any work that's carried out prior to we do approval on the on the um, application wouldn't be eligible so we have people that will call that they have emergency situations but they had to go ahead and get the, um, the work done and they may call but unfortunately we can't we can't go back and help where costs have already been um, the repair has already been done uh, one unique thing too is that with the disability tax credit um, we get a lot of people within our focus area that because of their income levels they may not need a disability tax credit so it, they may have never applied for it but if there are repairs to the home that are related to the disability of the individual has the, who can get the credit, we can deduct that uh, disability tax credit from the amount. And I think it's around eight, $8,500 yeah. right now. Yeah. So that can be a significant reduction to bring somebody in line with, um, with our income limits. And if you have a couple that's in the house that, uh, uh, or uh, two individuals, we count both of their tax credits. Um, as long as the repairs are reasonably related to the, um, to the disability that the person has. What we do is we basically provide a financial um, uh, assistance to the to the clients, the homeowners. So the contract is actually between the homeowner and the contractor. So we don't we are not in the middle of that relationship. We provide the funding to the homeowner to hire a contractor. So what we do is we get bids from contractors that the homeowner sends in. So we look at it that all things being e equal, that they've submitted bids of people they want to work on the property. So we go by the lowest bid that comes in. And that's how we set the approval based on that. But all arrangements between hiring the contractor and any disputes or anything arise between the home and the contractor, it's, it's, it's between them and the result. Right. So we'll get into some of the program specifics that we have. Um, so we have what's called the Senior Citizens Assistance Program, a SCAP, and the Provincial Home Emergency Repair Program, FERP. Basically, it's, it's the same program. Um, but the seniors, the SCAP program is specifically targeted to people that are 65 years and older. Um, with that there, the maximum assistance is $6,500, and that can be provided every five years. Um, if somebody applied to the program and only received a portion of the $6,500 and another repair item come up, so maybe they had um, an oil tank they had to get replaced or a water heater, and we assisted with that. Um, if they're still under that maximum of $6,500, we can provide additional assistance up to that maximum, and that's, that's over a five-year period. The Emergency Repair Program, or ERP, that's a $7,000 grant for a home, and that's specific to rural areas. Um, so that's looking at places that have, I think it's 2,200 yeah. people or less, yeah. and there's no central core um, um, town or, town or, or something. something, yeah, yeah. exactly. So that's specifically for that and to deal with uh, sudden losses, sort of, uh, you know, you lost your heat, um, plumbing, sewer, some of those major repairs, again, that we can, we can assist with. And we do have programs for, in not all cases, there are some programs that actually, if you're not a homeowner but you're a resident of the home, uh, there is assistance available. One of those programs is the Access a Home Program. And this is geared to individuals who are currently in a wheelchair or reasonably expected to be within the next six months. And this helps with the architectural barriers that, uh, so widening doors, uh, maybe a ramp, um, um, a roll-in shower to accommodate the wheelchair and those kind of things. So that's specific to those uh, repairs that are related to the, um, somebody trying to ambulate their uh, residence with a wheelchair. Uh, right. So for example, if you have a parent who's wheelchair bound and they're going to move into your home with you if any modifications need to be made to accommodate them being in a wheelchair they could apply to this program so so the parent would apply it would be their income that would be counted but then it could, regardless of what the income is in the home yeah and what do we do is um, so we assess it based on the, the target individual yeah. and what they do is get permission from the homeowner to conduct have the repairs done okay. um, where they don't own it, right? So yeah. it would be um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the applicant would actually be the person who's going to use it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, so the next section we get into is forgivable loans and um, I'm going to give some background on, on how they work. Um, so they're they're set up as a straight loan. 
but the way the, the program goes, as long as you stay within the house, so as long as you own and occupy the house, you fall within the program criteria, and you'll to, uh, continue to earn forgiveness, and that's over a one to five year period, and that depends on the amount of assistance you get. So if you get the mac maximum assistance, it would be the full five years that it gets forgiven over. And what happens is in our system, as long as you meet the, the ongoing requirements of owning and occupying, the um, assistance just gets, the payment gets done internally in our system. So actually there's no bill or payment that goes out to the individual. The only time that program becomes repayable is if the person uh, ceases to live in the house or if they sell the house. Okay. And then that becomes due and payable, the balance. Not anything forgiven up to that point is forgiven and it would just be the balance from that point forward. One, one common occurrence is you have uh, a husband and a wife um, who've received a, a forgivable loan and one of them passes away before the forgivable period is up. If both of them have signed the promissory note, um, then it doesn't become payable uh, because there's one remaining in the home still living in the home. Yeah. And if both of them would pass away, it would be disappear. It would be or payable by payable the estate. The estate. By the estate. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And only the balance that's not forgiven at that point. Right. Yeah. And so, so one more question on that. So, sure. if the promissory note is only signed by one person and that person passes on, is the the other is the spouse who wasn't on the promissory note responsible to pay? No, a spouse actually. In, in it would be all cases, you you'd have both sign on the promissory okay. note. Okay. Yeah. So you so would make sure of that. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. 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 But we have had cases where somebody else may have resided in the house that um, might not have been the owner, but through the passing of the individual, right. it went to them. And they were originally part of the house during the application and all that. We can qualify them and okay. get them to sign a promissory note to continue on the forgiveness. So our major program we have um, is the Residential Rehabilitation Assistance Program, and that's up to a maximum of $18,000. And that's one of the ones that's every 15 years. So if you received... Again, portion of that assistance within the last 15 years, we can top it up to that maximum of 18,000. Um, and uh, that's the one that gets tied to a house. So if somebody, uh, say, within the past two years has received assistance for, say, a furnace, um, the house already has that updated. So that's why it's, it gets reduced from based on the property level as opposed to the individual level, because the house still benefited, that residence benefited from the assistance that was provided. Um, and this is to maintain a minimum standard of, of, of um, kind of upkeep of the house so that, um, um, like all repairs that are identified, so if we went in and there was a plumbing issue, there's no heat, uh, you have a leaking roof, with that program all repair items have to be addressed. We can't just do the furnace because it, uh, we know we're leaving somebody in a situation where although they have the furnace fixed, if their electrical is a fire hazard, then you really haven't advanced their situation by leaving them in an unsafe environment. Mm -hmm. We've seen situations where the, the, the repairs are estimated to cost more than 18000 And when that's the case, anything over and above the eighteen, the homeowner is responsible to, to contribute, um, which can make it tough sometimes, but um, yeah. Because yeah, we already know we're dealing with the individuals that... Uh, uh, the income, low income levels and that mm -hmm. stuff, so it's, it, it does become a challenge. Yeah. The disabled, uh, Disability Residential Rehabilitation Assistance Program is a, it, that program can be paired with the, the other RAP program, so you can get an additional $16,000 <coughs> of assistance. Again, it's 15 year um, period that that's available over, and the house would have to be up to the minimum standard that would be under our RAP program. So as long as the home is up, up to standard with that, or if we can bring it up to standard with those with that initial money, the disability repair assistance is also available there for helping with, uh, with all kinds of uh, things that may help with somebody's mobility issues and their, and their disability. So, for example, if somebody applies for a ramp for a wheelchair, uh, and that's all they apply for, when our inspectors go in, they have to uh, also check that the house is up to a certain standard. So if the furnace isn't adequate, or the electrical needs upgrading, that has to be addressed in order to qualify for the ramp. And for those repairs, we can use the RAP program and then combine it with the, this DRAP program for the ramp. So both can be combined. And with that program, it's when you combine the two of them and it goes over $25,000, uh, the mortgage has to be taken on the property because of the amount. 
but legal costs can be factored in and are still within that maximum between the two assistance programs, but legal fees can be added in and, and covered under that program as well. Yeah, and it's still forgivable even with a mortgage. Mm -hmm. yep. The HASI program is another program that um, it's, it's, it's geared towards helping individuals, uh, seniors again, and that's helping with um, maybe things with the mobility, maybe grab bars within the washroom, raised toilets, uh, um, could be uh, uh, railings along the wall, kind of helping uh, when they're going down the hallway or something like that. Um, so with their diminished abilities, it helps to kind of help with those age-related kind of uh, issues. And again, it's one that um, a resident of either the house or uh, if it's a rental property, um, they can apply for that. They'd have to get the landlord's permission. The landlord would, um, would, it would have to be up to a standard to make sure that they're living in an adequate and safe environment and um, that assistance can be used to help that. And that's $3,500 maximum. That's a one time if, it, if you receive the maximum, but we can do, um, it could be a couple of uh, applications that bring you up to that maximum again. And that's forgiven over a six month period, so it's a shorter period of time. Yep, so the down payment assistance program, uh, it's to help first time homeowners purchase a home uh, with their down payment. So the maximum assistance available is 5% of the purchase price of the home. Uh, they must be a first-time homeowner, which is in keeping with CMHC's guidelines. Um, the maximum household income uh, has to be 75000 or less. And the purchase price of the home must be less than 200000 That was recently bumped up from 150000 because of market, market conditions as they are today. Um, we ask that the applicants have a pre-approval in place from either a bank or some other financial institution prior to coming to us for the, the down payment assistance. Uh, and obviously they have to meet um, our lending criteria, uh, job stability, a good credit rating, the ability to repay their debt. So the loans are interest free. It's a maximum 10 year term. Uh, no payments are required in the first year. So 12 months from approval is when they can um, begin paying. Uh, the loan has to go strictly towards the purchase price of the home. It can't be used for renovations or other closing costs, such as legal fees. Uh, and a mobile home is eligible if it's permanently affixed to a foundation on the property owned by the applicant. Um, yeah. And the small loan assistance program, uh, it's maximum this is just basically a straight, a straight loan, a uh, term loan. Maximum assistance of uh, 20000 Household income must be less than 60000 uh, It's a 10-year term. Uh, for, the amount, for amounts approved, 10, 10 grand and under, it's secured with a promissory note. 10 grand and over, it's secured with a mortgage on the property. And uh, again, uh, because it's a loan, the applicant has to meet minimum qualifying criteria, such as good credit, job stability, the ability to repay the debt. And something where Sean mentioned before about that if the assistance required exceeds what we have available, we can use the small loan assistance program to, um, to work with those other, the disability repair program and the homeowner repair program. Right. So, so if estimated repairs came in at, let's say, 22000 we could look at doing it under wrap, 18000 and the balance under a small, small loan. Questions or comments? And, and just to maybe something else to mention that uh, we focus specifically on the homeowner programs. We do have a, an assistance program for rental properties as well. And that can be um, uh, individual rental apartment units or it can be a rooming house. And there's assistance available for that. And um, with those programs, you have to meet uh, uh, standards of, of, um, of quality of the housing that you're putting the individuals into. And they have to meet the, the income requirements. So it's to get the assistance, you have to house people that are targets of our program that uh, and, help me. And there's a cap on how much you can charge from rent per month. Okay. Um, and we have all that information if anybody's interested. So. Yeah. And then the one last thing is the um, for uh, developers of new housing, that's a program that's delivered uh, out of Halifax. And um, we do have contact available if anybody's interested. We can provide that with you guys at any time. That, uh, so that's if somebody's looking at doing a, a new build for, uh, for 
uh, affordable housing. Um, I just want to mention it's great to see those limits kind of going up a little bit because yeah. costs mm -hmm. are going through the roof. Um, yeah. Yes. Not sure if there's going to be any wiggle room on the 18,000 in the near future, <laughs> but I feel that contracting prices are going to also continue to rise, and yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure how far that's going to get you in, right. in a year or so. So just well, just one example is um, yeah. two by four that cost you <laughs> say three bucks right. at the yeah. beginning of all this is we've seen nine dollars, yeah. and yeah. they started to come down but gone back up, right? So it's, yeah. so it's yeah. hard. What's the typical time turnaround for uh, applications? It, it, it's Depends, hard to say. Suspect, so right? it's the way the process works is we receive the application and uh, determine if the, the applicant is eligible. Um, and we look at the repair items. If uh, we see the need, uh, we'll move it to the inspection stage. So we'll have one of our inspectors go out and do a, a physical assessment of the repair items needed. Um, if it's uh, And then once he comes back, him and I will get together and uh, look at putting out some, some sheets, some bid or estimate sheets. Uh, for the homeowner to get quotes. So we usually require two quotes per repair item, and that's usually what takes the longest. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so once those quotes are received, we'll go over them and ensure that they're, they're okay. Uh, sometimes they're too high, we'll ask the homeowner to get a third quote. Um, and then, uh, but if the bids are acceptable, uh, we'll identify the lowest. Uh, and then the application is sent for review to management, and then the decision is made. Mm -hmm. So it, it varies. Some are fast, some are not so fast. Mm -hmm. And we, we kind of triage everything based on the urgency of the repair. Yeah. So yeah. if it's no heat, no water, those kind of things, yeah. go to the the roof top. leaking, yeah, we get those dealt with right away. Um, others that are, are critical but not urgent, um, the wait list could be two to four months. So yeah. Yeah, it depends on the, the nature of the repairs and, and that kind of stuff. So. Yeah. And there you have it, folks. That wraps up this week's edition of Telil's Roundtable. Thanks to my colleagues at Telil Community Television, Nick Boudreau, Cody Party, and Becky Borino, for filming and formatting the footage from Richmond Council's latest Committee of the Whole meeting on Monday, April 11th. If you have any suggestions for future editions of Roundtable, be sure to contact me directly or Telil Community Television at the station in Arishat. <laughs> <laughs>